Thank you. Excuse me. I like that introduction. I wish more were like that. I'm going to spill this water. Well, good evening. Can I take this off of here? Is that okay? I'll wander around a little bit. And uh, plus, I'm going to use PowerPoint. I'll have to explain a little bit about PowerPoint to you. Uh, I hate PowerPoint. Uh, <laughs> never use it. Um, especially when you go to these places and somebody puts up a PowerPoint and it's got like a 2.5 uh, font and nine million words on the PowerPoint thing and and they read every single word on it and you look down at the bottom and it says slide one of 9,842. <laughs> you know you're in for a long night. I'm not going to do anything like that. Uh, so I hate PowerPoint, but that said, I'm going to use PowerPoint tonight um, simply to use some maps. That's all I've got. I've got several maps. And in reality, we had a little bit of trouble and almost didn't have the PowerPoint tonight. Uh, and we could get by without it. But I think a visual uh, is a little bit better. So I'll be dealing with, uh, with some maps. I also brought my handy dandy pointer here, which if I get in your way, uh, just kick me or something and I'll, I'll get out of the way. But I'll point a little bit as uh, we go through. I use this thing for two reasons. Um, one is when I go speaking like this and use PowerPoint, which I hate, and I mentioned I hate it, um, to point out things on the map and so on. The other is we have ourselves a crazy, absolutely crazy cat that will not do anything you want her to do, but she knows exactly what you want her to do, but she'll just look at you and, and she gets out of the garage and all that and you can't get her back in and you use this thing though and she's a sucker for it every time. And so that's why I use it uh, as well. But that's, uh, that's kind of the, the ground rules a little bit. So we're going to be talking about Vicksburg. And I do appreciate you having me up here. We was at Milwaukee last night talking about Shiloh. Uh, we'll be back at uh, Kenosha in the morning talking about Shiloh. Uh, not the same talk. Uh, last night was dealing with the terrain factor and, and the terrain of the battlefield at Shiloh tomorrow is more of a uh, historiographical memory type of, of examination of the hornet's nest. I call it the anatomy of an icon. How did the, the icon that is the hornet's nest become so uh, famous and, and does it warrant that, that fame? Um, but tonight we're dealing with Vicksburg, a little bit farther down south and a little bit later in the war. Uh, and we're going to talk about Vicksburg basically through the eyes of Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, we got any Grant fans here? Uh, no. we, I would guess we would. Uh, I asked this last night at, uh, at, at uh, where was it last night? Milwaukee, uh, if we had any Braxton Bragg fans. And nobody would admit to be a Braxton Bragg fan. I, in fact, I've never met one. We got one, right? right. Well, Larry, you, you uh, okay. Um, <laughs> once, once, please. Yeah. Uh, how many of you are Vicksburg fans? I know we got Vicksburg fans. How many of you are going on the Vicksburg trip? Oh, yeah. wow. Good, good. How many of you have at least been to Vicksburg? Maybe you're not going on a trip, but you've been to Vicksburg. Okay, all right. So you're interested in Vicksburg. Let's be honest. How many of you just came for the cheesecake tonight? That's all. <laughs> you, okay, we got one back there. All right. Uh, the decision was always my own. I'll give you just a little bit of explanation as to where this came from. And many of you will know kind of the, the background history of this. Uh, but Southern Illinois University Press published over the course of, what, decades? Uh, 32 volumes of the Ulysses S. Grant papers. And John Y. Simon was uh, the editor of that collection, and it is absolutely wonderful. Uh, I don't know if you have, um, you know, if you, anybody have the whole set? All oh, 32 volumes. There you go, Rob. Um, they're, they're not cheap. They're, they're not cheap. I love 100 bucks a, a, a volume. Uh, they are online, actually. The Mississippi State University Library has digitized those and has them online. It's very hard to get through them and find what you want and all, but, uh, but they are digitized. Uh, they just ended that series, uh, monumental series. In fact, weren't, weren't the grant papers the first papers publication? Uh, I believe I, I read something about that. Uh, John Y. Simon, of course, died not long ago. John Marzalek uh, at Mississippi State University took over the process and published uh, I believe volume 32. Uh, when Southern Illinois University Press finished with the grant papers, they decided, well, let's go into, you know, the logical thing to do would be to go into a monograph series uh, using those papers to, to publish monographs on Grant's life. And uh, so let's, let's start a new series. It's called The World of Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, and to date, there have been four volumes published already. 
uh, and a lot of others are, are uh, in the works by historians that you will know of, Steve Woodworth, Harold Hoser, Frank Williams, and uh, John Wall uh, doing, doing volumes and talking about doing volumes. Uh, John Marzalek and I are the editors of this series, and uh, I chose to do the Vicksburg campaign series uh, book in in the series so it's basically a uh, look at the Vicksburg campaign through Ulysses S. Grant's eyes and uh, I think the title you know you always kind of want to pick a title that will illustrate what the book's about and really the way I, I, I decided to do this uh, was to deal with decisions that Grant made during the Vicksburg campaign and uh, in that sense it's kind of a can anybody well, I won't ask if there are any George Bush fans in here. I don't want to get any response out of that. Y'all know who George Bush is, don't you? Okay. All right. Um, but anybody read his memoir? You know, all these presidents, when you leave office, you write your memoirs and make tons of money and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, if you read his book, uh, what is it, Decision Points, I believe, he, he broke his life down in, I think it's like 10, 10 different major decisions. Quit drinking and, and you know, run for, for president, all that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> what? One or the other, pick one, you know. Uh, at any rate, what I chose to do is to look at Grant through his decision-making process uh, during the Vicksburg campaign. So probably what you hear tonight won't be anything groundbreaking. I mean, Vicksburg has been plowed pretty good. Uh, and we know about Grant. Grant's been plowed pretty good. However, there hasn't been a book dealing with Grant specifically at Vicksburg since I think it's 1956. Anybody have the old Earl Myers, Earl Schneck Myers book? Grant, uh, The Web of Victory, I think, was the, the, the name of it. So that's the last time it's really been, been uh, looked at. And of course, since then, we have all the Grant papers and, and so on that's, uh, that's been published. So uh, it's an effort to, to uh, utilize that and to, to move forward. Now, of course, Vicksburg is very important uh, in terms of the war itself, and we could probably get into a debate here. Um, I don't know, you Chicago folks, are y'all heavily tilted toward the Eastern Theater? Are y'all Gettysburg folks or, or anything like that? Y'all are Western, more Western, Western, more Western, that's good. Uh, there is obviously this lively debate going on whether Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain won the war at, at Gettysburg and, and all that kind of stuff or whether it was won out, out west. We won't get into that debate, uh, but it is very important uh, to understand the war in the west, to understand obviously Vicksburg uh, and its importance, and to understand Ulysses S. Grant, because this is the crowning achievement, I think, of Grant's career. I mean, there you talk about Grant the Butcher, and Grant, you know, this, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I, I can't see Grant the Butcher in the Vicksburg campaign. That is a, absolutely a campaign of finesse, uh, he didn't have the huge numbers and, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, studying Vicksburg and dealing with Grant, how Grant you know progresses and, and so on is, is very important. Now we won't have time to go into all of that tonight. We will deal mainly with the military aspects and be a little bit of a primer to you know use, that are going to Vicksburg uh, next May. Uh, but there's a lot of other aspects of this. For instance, politics. Grant is heavily involved in politics. I mean, you most of the time you don't you hear a little bit about the generals and politics and, and all that, but but everything Grant does is with a view toward politics, and he almost gets removed. Uh, in fact, Lincoln uh, basically tells Halleck, you got to get Grant going down there, uh, or we're going to find somebody else. At the same time, they're telling Rosecrans the same thing in Middle Tennessee, of course, and telling uh, the, the generals in Virginia and so on. Lincoln wants, wants uh, things to go. Uh, but there's a lot of politics involved. There's a lot of economics involved. You normally think about economics in terms of military campaigns and generals and all that. Well, remember Grant is commanding not only the Army of the Tennessee, but he's also commanding the Department of the Tennessee. And he is the administrator of that department. And there's a whole lot of trade going on, cotton trading, um, and a whole lot of uh, different kind of economic uh, issues going on. And Grant has to deal with all that. Um, a lot of social aspects. You deal with slavery. What about freed slaves? Contraband. Uh, you know about the story of Grant uh, expelling the Jews from his department and gets him in a whole lot of trouble. Uh, he gets into a whole lot of trouble. You don't hear so much about it, but uh, a whole lot of trouble when he tells his commanders, quit taking slaves off the plantations, leave them there and all that. And Halleck and, and Stanton get all over him and say that that's against government policy and, and so on. So there's a whole lot of social aspects dealing with, with racial issues and so on that Grant has to deal with. And then, of course, you get into Grant's family issues. 
uh, his father, Jesse, if you know much about Jesse, he's always looking to make a dime and he's looking to uh, make that dime off of his son who has a little bit of an inside road here. And so he has to deal with his father. Uh, his fi And this is a lot of the stuff that you get in those grant papers. If, if you sit down and read through this and get to the letters, you know, between him and Julia and him and his dad and, and all that, that you don't get in the official records. Uh, so, you know, you, you find out that he's dealing with Jesse about you know, him trying to make money and all that. And then he's dealing with Julia about educating the kids and what are we going to do with the kids this, this summer and all that kind of stuff. And then you find out that Julia and Jesse don't get along and he scolds both of them about how they're acting toward each other. I mean, it's a, it's a whole lot of, of personal stuff that's really interesting that we don't have time to go into tonight. One story, though, that kind of illustrates the, the personal aspect of this, and you may have heard this story, um, Grant, during the middle of the Vicksburg campaign, is on his uh, headquarters ship, I believe it's the Magnolia. Of course, we think of the Tigris all the time that uh, is the famous headquarters ship at Shallow, uh, or headquarters boat. Uh, the Tigris, incidentally, is sunk in one of the passages of Vicksburg, I believe the April uh, 22nd passage of Vicksburg. At any rate, uh, Grant's custom is to take his teeth out, his false teeth, and to place them in a, a wash bin. And uh, he does that every morning when he gets up and, and gets going and, and all that. Well, one night he decides to put his teeth in the wash bin at night and uh, sleeps without them. So the steward comes in early the next morning before Grant gets up, takes the wash bin that he doesn't know the teeth's in and dumps them in the river. And so Grant is gumming orders for much of the Vicksburg campaign and he doesn't have his teeth. And he tells Julia, get in touch with a dentist in Cincinnati that made me my teeth so that I can get a new pair or find a dentist in Memphis that, that can get me new teeth. So I mean, those are the kind of things you don't normally think about when you're dealing with a general in a campaign. But those are aspects of it. Now, again, we're going to deal mainly with the military aspects. And uh, basically there are eight different major decisions that Ulysses S. Grant makes in dealing with the, the Vicksburg campaign. So we can boil it down, I don't quite have 10 with, uh, with George Bush, but uh, eight major decisions and the eight chapters in this, this book uh, will revolve around these, these eight different chapters. So let's get uh, to the first slide here and you'll see all of my 9,000 words. I'm just kidding, it's just a map. Uh, the first decision that Grant makes is a little bit um, anticlimactic, if you will, but that is the decision to go after Vicksburg. And you say, oh, you're all, in, you're, you're, you're inspiring me now. You're, you're, you're really telling us something to go after Vicksburg. Well, it is a little more surprising than, than what you think. Uh, the, the choice to move after Vicksburg, to go after Vicksburg, to capture Vicksburg is not made into the fall of 1862 when the Vicksburg campaign actually begins, but it should have been made much earlier. It should have been made by Henry Halleck, in June of 1862, but it was not made at that point. Because Henry Halleck, when he captures Corinth, Mississippi, and what did I do on my, my cat would be uh, devastated here. Uh, Corinth up here at the crossing of the Memphis and Charleston, the Mobile and Ohio, of course. That is the, the focal point of the entire Tennessee River campaign when they're starting moving down the Tennessee River, Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson, uh, down to Shiloh and eventually to the Siege of Corinth in May of 1862. That's the focal point to capture the crossing point of those two railroads, and that occurs on May the 30th, 1862. Now, Henry Halleck is the Union commander in charge of the entire Western Theater, and he should have moved on down to Vicksburg, but he says, well, no, we're not going to do that. If any of you are into military theory and all that, he is more Jomanian, uh, Jomany, Henry Jomany, uh, and he spreads his forces out both to the east and to the west, to Memphis and to Chattanooga and, and all over the place. Uh, garrisoning what he's already captured rather than going to capture more. He is not Clausewitzian in, in nature, which you go after the armies and, and, uh, and forget the territory. Uh, Halleck is, is very much, let's secure our supply lines and, and consolidate what we, what we already have. Uh, Halleck also says, well, we can't push down south uh, in the, the dreaded winter. You know, it's coming up on June and July, and we can't go that far south down into Mississippi. It's going to be hot and, and so on and we just, we just can't do it. Of course, Grant proves him wrong the very next year when he's marching around Mississippi in May, and June, and, and July of 1863. So it could have been done then, but Halleck doesn't make that decision. Now, the decision could also have been made uh, to go after Vicksburg in July of 1862, just a couple of months later, when Henry Halleck 
the department commander, the Western Theater commander, is moved to Washington, and he becomes what Lincoln says, the best clerk I ever had, or something like that. Um, so Halleck is, is gone, leaving Grant basically in charge of operations here in West Tennessee and northern Mississippi. But what Halleck does is leave Grant in charge, but he doesn't give them the, the authority to, to do what he needs to do. Uh, Halleck has been begging in 1862 to have one consolidated Western command. And of course he wants himself to be that, that commander. Well, when Halleck moves to Washington, he thinks that nobody else can do what I've been doing. And so he breaks that, that department back up into individual commands and leaves Grant in command in West Tennessee, the district of West Tennessee. Buell is in command of the Ohio Department and, and all of that. So he breaks it up contrary to what he was arguing should have been done when he wanted the, the command. So uh, he doesn't give Grant that overall authority to make the decisions you do uh, basically what I tell you to do from Washington is, uh, is Grant's uh, orders here. Now, in the fall of 1862, of course, we have things break loose for the Union High Command when Lee starts invading Maryland, culminating in Antietam, of course. Bragg starts invading Kentucky, culminating in Perryville. Uh, Van Dorn and Price invade West Tennessee and culminates in, in uh, Corinth and, and so on. So uh, Halleck has got a lot to do, and he figures out, okay, I can't handle all this. I've got to let loose of a little bit of this micromanagement and let these guys make some decisions. And so on October the 16th, he will give the orders that Grant will be elevated up to that department command, which he should have gotten in July, and able to make decisions that should have been made all the way back in June, really. Grant takes the official command on October, I believe October the 25th, and so he, he has that authority now, and it takes Grant all of one day to formulate an offensive, and he makes that decision to start operations against Vicksburg. So it's not quite as simple as it might seem, but by late October of 1862, Grant starts this process. Um, it will eventually develop into two different phases, uh, this movement southward toward Vicksburg. Initially, Grant will concentrate his troops around Grand Junction here and will begin to move southward along the, the uh, Mississippi Central Railroad. Uh, toward Grenada, which will move on down, of course, to Jackson. When you get east of Vicksburg, and you all know the problems, the ge geography and so on of Vicksburg, you can't get to it from the north because of the delta. Uh, you, the south is, is uh, in Confederate territory. You can't go up the bluffs, um, you know, 300-foot bluffs at, up the river at, at Vicksburg. The best way to get to Vicksburg is from the east from Jackson, and so Grant will decide to move down the Mississippi Central. That's, that's logical, using the railroad, we'll repair the railroad as we go, and, uh, and we'll supply ourselves with that. In the midst of this campaign, of course, Grant will send Sherman, when they get to Oxford, back to Memphis to take command of new troops that are showing up. We'll talk about that in just a second. And Sherman will lead a second effort down the river itself which will culminate in uh, operations right around the Yazoo River and north of Vicksburg there, uh, what we know today as Chickasaw Bow. And I don't remember, do, do we have another map? I think we've got another map that uh, might show this. Yeah, um, you see Grant's operations here as he moves down uh, as far as uh, Water Valley and Coffeville, actually. You see Sherman there, goes down to the, to the Yazoo and then up the Yazoo to, uh, to the Chickasaw Bio area. The idea is that we'll make this a two-pronged assault, uh, advance, and the Confederates that are, are stationed here may have to leave and go defend here, or the Confederates that are stationed here may have to leave and go, go defend here. If we hit them in two different areas, they'll have less chance of, of, uh, of stopping both. Maybe we'll have success in one or the other, and maybe Sherman will actually capture Vicksburg here while I'm fiddling around on, on the railroad here. Either one that works, fine, it'll, it'll take care of the situation. Now, as we know, neither works. Um, Grant is turned back because of a cavalry raid by Earl Van Dorn that moves through uh, the Pontotoc area and will hit Holly Springs on December the 20th. Uh, at the same time, Nathan Bedford Forrest, I, I can't resist this. We got any Nathan Bedford Forrest fans up here? <laughs> really? Wow. 
Boy, well, y'all fit in Tennessee real good. Um, Nathan Bedford Forest uh, is loose in West Tennessee, breaking the Mobile and Ohio Railroad bridges uh, over the Obion River in northwestern Tennessee. And those two cavalry raids combined will break up Grant's logistical network, and he has trouble getting, uh, getting supplies. And so the Grant of 1862 is not the grant of 1863 or the grant of 1864. Had this been the grant of 1864, he'd have said, I don't care, I'm, keep, I'm moving right along. But at this point, he says, well, we got to retreat because that's just what you do. They, they break your communications, they break your lines of supply. We got to retreat. It's just, just how it works. So Grant pulls back uh, into northern Mississippi and, and southwestern Tennessee. Sherman, meanwhile, of course, uh, will attack up the Chickasaw uh, bio area, the Walnut Hills there, on December the 29th, and will be repulsed. And he sends this famous message, I landed, I attacked, I was repulsed, and I got out of there, basically, I'm paraphrasing, <laughs> is, uh, is basically what he says. Uh, these two failures will sting pretty hard. Um, Operations are, are stalled here in, uh, in the Mississippi Valley, and this comes on top of, obviously, the debacle at Fredericksburg on the 13th, where huge numbers of casualties are accrued. Uh, it also will come on the, uh, uh, just before the news of the huge amount of casualties at Stones River, uh, right around the, the turn of the, the year there, the turn of the calendar. Uh, so huge casualties, major reverses for uh, the Federals as uh, we're moving through the winter of 1862-1863. So, the first decision, let's go to Vicksburg, let's take Vicksburg, let's open the Mississippi River. Well, it's not working out quite so well. And we start to see something in Ulysses S. Grant, some, some attributes. Uh, we Grant fans, did I already ask that? I, I think I, I asked that. I admit I'm a Grant fan. I I'm, grew up in Mississippi, uh, all of that, you know. I'm not afraid to say I'm, I'm a Grant fan. I'm not afraid to call him out when I, when I think he needs it, and there are some problems with, with Grant. Uh, I don't think drinking is one of them, because, you know, he never puts the, the army in danger with his drinking. Uh, I think, actually, one of his major problems, particularly early on, is overconfidence. He thinks, I'm going to show up and say boo, and they're just going to run scared, you know, away. Uh, but he's overconfident in Belmont. He's overconfident in Fort Donaldson. He's overconfident in Shiloh. He's overconfident in the early stages of the Vicksburg campaign. Um, and it just doesn't work out quite the way uh, that he wants to. But the initial attempt, at least we're moving, moving toward Vicksburg. Now, that leads to a second decision, and that is dealing somewhat with these politics that, uh, that I was talking about. And we're not going to go into to heavy detail here. Uh, but eventually, by the early days of January, uh, probably the first couple of weeks in January, Grant has to redo this two-pronged operation into Mississippi. And the decision is, he decides to make the Vicksburg operations, the Vicksburg campaign, a one-pronged advance. We're going we're gonna to make it one one place, one, one place. And the reason for this is inter-army politics, it's, it's uh, national level politics. John A. McClernand, we were talking about the, the ten most famous Illinoisans, and John McClernand ain't one of them. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, if, you, if you said the ten most troublesome uh, Illinoisans, you might include him on, on that list. Uh, John McClernand, of course, you know about John McClernand from Little Egypt, and, and he's appointed for, by Lincoln the Republican. He's a Democratic representative, been in Congress and all of that, uh, to solidify support in southern Illinois and, and all that. I've always had a sneaking suspicion that Lincoln just wanted to get him on a battlefield and get him shot. Uh, <laughs> but I, I can't prove that, but um, I, I have thought of that. At any rate, uh, this harebrained idea of giving McClernand the ability, and this comes from Stanton, Secretary of War Stanton, uh, signed off on by Lincoln himself, Lincoln endorses this plan, uh, to send McClernand to Illinois and Indiana and Iowa to recruit troops. And boy, he recruits troops. He recruits like 30, 40, 50,000 troops. Uh, the problem is he sends them south to wait on him, and he has the authority, of course, to lead them against Vicksburg. Now, how are you going to do that? Are you going to lead a uh, uh, mini army in the midst of somebody else's department and not report to him? Or are you going to report to him? They didn't think all this through. Probably never thought McClernand would get to the point of actually leading 
those troops. But lo and behold, McClernand re uh, recruits all these troops. He sends them down to Memphis to wait on him. And here we've got Grant and Sherman sitting there saying, you know, there are a bunch of troops here. And we know this nut McClernand is going to come down here and want to command all this. So while he's not here, Sherman, you take all those troops and you go down to Chickasaw, Ohio and take Vicksburg. And if we take Vicksburg, the problem's solved. What is, what is McClernand tasked with doing? Capturing Vicksburg. You capture Vicksburg before McClernand gets here, problem solved. We don't have to worry about McClernand and this, this idiotic plan we've got going on. Well, as we know, Sherman fails. And so McClernand shows up down here at, uh, at Napoleon and Young's Point and so on and says, all right, Sherman, give me my army. I'm commanding all these. I'll outrank you, Sherman. Plus, I recruited all these. They're my army. So here's Grant in, in northern Mississippi, retreating in northern Mississippi, and he hears Sher has, here's McClernand has gone down and taken, taken Sherman's army. And so now he's got a problem. I don't want McClernand in charge down here. No telling what he may do. And this is solidified by the fact that McClernand goes on a, what Grant calls a wild goose chase where? He goes up the Arkansas River, or the White River, to Arkansas Post. Captures Arkansas. Grant says he's on a wild goose chase. We need to, to limit operations to the Mississippi River. And, um, and so Grant has a, a problem on his hands. Do I let McClernand continue to operate on the river independently? Or do I go there and outrank him and myself take command? Who's going to take command in, in central Mississippi here? Uh, we got we got too many uh, places and not enough generals, or maybe too many places and too many generals. You know, we, We've got to do something. So Grant makes the second major decision. We're going to make the Mississippi River axis the major axis of advance. We're going to make it a one-prong advance, and I'm going to be in charge. I outrank McClernand, so I'm going to be in charge. So he's taking care of this whole political issue, and boy, does McClernand start balking. Oh, he starts writing Lincoln. I've been, I've been, uh, uh, you know, shelved. I've, I've, hear me out. You know, I've, I've been, I've been uh, taken over, and, and he starts waving this paper. Lincoln signed this. I have the authority to take my troops and go capture Vicksburg. And uh, they get, they get word that uh, you know they're supposed to name their corps, number their corps, the fifteenth and sixteenth uh, and seventeenth and thirteenth corps. And uh, uh, McClernand starts calling his corps the, the first corps, you know, of, of my army. And uh, Sherman, yours is the second corps, you know. And, uh, and uh, Sherman gets word about the, his, his becomes the 15th corps and writes something about the 15th corps. And McClernand writes him a note and says, by what authority are you calling your troops the 15th corps? They're the second corps behind my first corps. And Sherman says, well, Grant told me to call it the 15th Corps because that's what we got from, from Washington. So McClernand is very, very touchy about this. And he just causes all kind of problems, just, just snipping, just barking, just chipping away, chirping at Grant uh, about this. But Grant stays very patient. That's another mark of, of Grant. Um, he's, he's very patient in this, uh, probably too patient. But he decides, I'm going to command the one advance down the river and we're going to move all the troops southward toward Vicksburg. Okay, third major decision. This is January. Our battles normally fought in January. Name me a major Civil War battle fought in January. Mill Springs, uh, getting into, into Stones River a little bit. There's just not a lot of battles fought in January. February either, for that matter. you got Fort Henry Fort Don every once in a while you get one, but when are most of the battles fought? When are the wilderness campaigns start? The Atlanta campaign, all, you wait until the roads dry out, things dry out in the spring, right? In, in May. Well, you've got two or three months here that you don't have a whole lot of good time to do much of anything on solid ground. And what are we talking about here? Dealing with the river and the delta? Anybody been down to the delta? I grew up near the delta. There's not a worse place on earth than the Mississippi <laughs> Delta. Now, you may like the Delta, I don't know, but um, nothing but alligators and snakes and, and bobcats and bears and, and all that and water. You, you're not going to operate on, on, on dry ground, especially in the winter, until things start drying out. And even then, you're probably not going to have a whole lot of dry ground. So what is, Sherman, what is Grant going to do for the next two or three months? Well, if we can't move by land, we move by what? We move by water. We utilize the Navy, we move by water. So Grant starts, third major decision, we're going to start waterborne operations against Vicksburg. If nothing else, just to while the time away, and 
hey, they might work, actually. So we get into, and we'll go into detail. I think I put uh, uh, another map on here. Yeah, you see several of these operations. Uh, and even this will illustrate a little bit of Grant's uh, larger ability to coordinate all this. Look what a, uh, a big area we're dealing with here. Here's Vicksburg, here's Jackson, here's, uh, well, we don't even go up to Memphis here, but uh, Helena, Yazoo Pass, and, and all of that. Uh, the first major operation is the canal. You know about Williams Canal starting in 1862. Grant restarts uh, that trying to, to uh, cut Vicksburg off and bypass the batteries. Well, it doesn't work. They get to digging and the water starts going backwards in the canal and all. It's a big, a big mess. Uh, so then Grant decides, okay, we'll send McPherson to cut the levee at Lake Providence and see if we can flood all these rivers like the Tensas River and the Washita River and the Black River and down to the Red River. We're going to bypass Vicksburg by going way around. Well, that sort of works, but by the time they get all that done, spring is here and we don't need it anymore and the water level starts, starts dropping. So that never really works out. Well, then they decide, okay, let's cut the levee up here at Moon Lake and flood Yazoo Pass and let's send gunboats and troops in to uh, the Coldwater River, which connects with the Tallahatchie River, which connects with the Yalabusha River at Greenwood to form the Yazoo River, which if we go down the Yazoo River, then we're in that eastern sector, east of Vicksburg. Maybe that'll work. Well, they're stopped, of course, at Greenwood at Fort Pemberton, the Tallahatchie uh, River there. Uh, and you can still go to, anybody been to Fort Pemberton? You, you're really Vicksburg folks if you've been to Fort Pemberton. I grew up about 10 miles east of Fort Pemberton. Uh, there's not a lot there, but, uh, but there, there is some uh, remnants of earthworks and so on. Uh, that doesn't work. Then they decide, okay, we can go up uh, the Yazoo a little bit to Steele's Bio. And we go up Steele's Bio to uh, uh, Deer Creek and eventually the Black River, the Black Bio, and then over to the Rolling Fork and over down to the, to the Sunflower River and around by Seattle and through Japan and, and over around, come through Paris. And I mean, you get the picture here. They're going around the world here to try to get to that area east of Vicksburg. That doesn't work. You know the story there. Porter almost loses his fleet. Uh, in the in the small bios there has to back them out and, and all that. The, the point is Grant is trying every different way he can to get east of Vicksburg and none of it's working but it's keeping the army busy and there's not a lot else he can be doing except by water here and he's utilizing trying to utilize these these water routes. Now Grant will tell you in his memoirs and again I'm a Grant fan but if you read something in the memoirs Always check it with what he's writing at the time in the Grant papers, the 32 volumes, because sometimes it doesn't match up. Grant will tell you in his memoirs, well, I never really had any idea that any of these would work. We're just, you know, busy work, keeping the Army occupied and all that. They, it, well, none of this was going to work. Don't look at me like I'm crazy that, you know, I'm all this far-flung stuff. Grant was writing letters in February, March, April, saying, I have high hopes for this Yazoo Pass operation. This may be the key where we, where we fix this. And this may be our, our source of success here. Yazoo Pass steals by all of that. Uh, but none of them work, of course. Now, what it does illustrate is the, the area, the large um, canvas that Grant is painting on, if you will. How big is the Eastern Theater and all you Gettysburg aficionados and, and all that? You could probably plop the, Vicks, the, the whole Eastern Theater down in, in just this area here of what Grant is operating on in, in just one campaign. Uh, and you've got operations all the way up to Yazoo Pass and down at, at uh, uh, Lake Providence and so on. So uh, it illustrates the, Grant's growth as a commander of you know, multiple areas in a, a, a large area there. Okay, now fourth major decision. See, we're halfway over, or we're close to halfway over. Anyway. Uh, by April of 1863, Grant is to the point that he has worked himself. You ever painted yourself in a corner? I never have. I've never known anybody that's ever done that, but you've always heard about people painting themselves in a corner. I mean, you've got to be pretty dumb to paint yourself in a corner. <laughs> I assume it's been done before. I don't know. At any rate, Grant is kind of painting himself in a corner because he has moved down this river as far as he can go to Young's Point here in view of Vicksburg. Now, bring back the politics and all that. If Grant turns around now and goes back up the river and starts this whole thing over, 
What is everybody going to say? What are the newspaper editors? What are the politicians? What are they all going to say? Retreating. He's retreating again. He's been defeated again. Look, Grant, I know what he's doing. Remove him and, and all that kind of stuff. Grant realizes that it would be the death nail probably of his career if he goes back up north and starts down the rivers. Sherman is telling him. And you don't always listen to Sherman. You know, Sherman's like, uh, uh, you know, he enters a room mouth first. You know, he's got all these, all these <laughs> opinions and, and all that. Grant says, let's go back to Memphis, come down the railroad like we started to do, making sure that the railroad is secure and we'll have garrisons and, and all that kind of stuff. That's the logical way to do it. That's the way Halleck wants it done. That's the way Jomini would have said to do it. That's the way Napoleon would have done it. Let's do it the right way. Grant says, we can't. We cannot go back up to Memphis because that will be perceived as a major failure and probably you or I, neither one, will survive this politically. We can't do it. We can't stay where we are. We can't go back up north. The only thing to do is what? We've got to keep moving forward. And so basically, he's overshot Vicksburg now. What do, what do you do? Well, the fourth decision, and probably the key decision of the Vicksburg campaign, and really the most biggest gamble of the Vicksburg campaign, go to the next, next slide here, is when Grant will leapfrog from Young's Point, Millican's Bend, southward past Vicksburg and will cross the river there at Bruinsburg to come up south of Vicksburg to that area east of Vicksburg to, to get to Vicksburg itself. Now, this is dangerous. There ain't no plan B. If this don't work, we're done. I mean, Grant's career's over. Perhaps his life is over. There, there is no plan B. We have got to the point that this is the only option left, and if this don't work, we're done. It is, it is that serious. Uh, there are other, other issues that are involved here as well. Um, the, the, the Navy. How are we going to get across the river when we get south of, of Vicksburg? We've got to have the Navy there, and that's when he talks to Porter, and he says, all right, I want you to run the Vicksburg batteries. And Porter says, you want me to do what? <laughs> Have you seen those guns there? Uh, but Porter says, all right, I'll do it. But, there's a big but there. Porter says, listen to me. I want you to understand this. I'll pass the Vicksburg batteries. I don't know how many of my gunboats are going to get down there. If I go, though, I'm going with the best I got because they're the heaviest armored, and we're going to need that to pass the Vicksburg batteries. I'll do it, but you've got to understand we can't get back up because the current, these, these gunboats, you've been to the Cairo or you're going to the Cairo and all that, they make like, what, five or six knots? That ain't much. Going against the current, you'll be sitting ducks if you try to go back up the river against the current past Vicksburg. Porter says, once I get past, there's no getting back up. I just want you to understand that. Grant says, all right, I got it. We're in this too deep anyway. None of us probably going to survive it, so why not? <laughs> Pass the Vicksburg batteries. Porter goes on the moonless night of the 16th. On the 22nd, he uh, uh, sends another wave of ships past, and so the Navy is cooperating, but it's dangerous. Uh, the whole idea of supplies. Well, what about this Jomanian theory of, of got to have a secure line of supply? Well, is Grant really going to send supplies on this roundabout route, cross the river down there, and then get them to his army and so on? Uh, it's going to be very, very difficult. Now, the, probably the biggest issue here is that this is just not the way things are done. In, in military theory, you don't, you don't do things like this. You go back up to Memphis and come down the railroad. Halleck says, this is not the way you do it. Jomini would have said this is not the way you do it. Napoleon said it wouldn't have been the way to do it. This, this, is, going, this is flying in completely in the face of standard military theory at the time. And what does Grant say? Grant, when he crosses the river finally, he figures up, I can just see him standing there counting on his hands. Okay, if I send a message back to Halleck telling him what I've done, there's no telegraph down here. Okay, it's going to take three days to get to Washington. A couple days to formulate or three days to get back to me. I've got a little over a week. Can't get to him anyway. He says, you can do a lot in eight days. <laughs> We're going to do it. And maybe by the time orders get back not to do it, we'll have Vicksburg. We'll see. It flies 
in the face of conventional wisdom, but Grant's going to do it. Probably the key decision. So he'll move his army down. He originally intends to cross at, uh, at Grand Gulf on April the 29th. Porter's gunboats that have survived, uh, everything survives except the Tigris, uh, will not be able to, to uh, silence the, the uh, batteries at Grand Gulf on the 29th. So Grant says, all right, we'll do something different. Adaptability. Are you very adaptable? You ever known anybody that's not adaptable? I mean, you got to do it the exact way. I get tickled at these publishers. You know, some publishers, um, there, there's some in the middle, and those of you that have published you know, know this, uh, there's some in the middle that do things, you know, they adapt and, and so on, but there's some that, well, there's some on this end that just absolutely fly by the seat of their pants and don't know what they're doing tomorrow, but there's some that are so rigid. I had a publisher one time that we finished the book, uh, I don't know, just months early, they, they allotted so much time, you know, but the book wasn't going to come out until a certain day. And by golly, they didn't start selling those books, even though they're sitting in the warehouse for two or three months. They didn't, they didn't they weren't going to sell that book till the day it was due to come out, you know. So you can be too rigid. You can probably be a little less rigid than you should, but you need to be adaptable, especially in military terms. And so Grant says, all right, no big deal. We'll just move on down the river to Disharoon's plantation. We'll cross at Bruinsburg here and start moving northward toward Vicksburg. Key, key decision here at, uh, uh, at the critical point of the Vicksburg campaign. Uh, they fight the Battle of Port Gibson, of course, on May the 1st, and that solidifies Grant's foothold in, uh, in Mississippi, and uh, there's no turning back unless Grant is absolute defeat. He actually writes, I think he writes Julia, saying, you know, there's, there's no stopping us now unless we are whipped, and we've got to be badly whipped if we're going to stop now. The next decision is how to get to Vicksburg. Go to the next uh, slide. I think we've, yeah. Uh, all right, you cross here, you win the battle at Port Gibson. That puts you south of Bio Pierre which Grant really doesn't want to do, but it kind of is a blessing in disguise because it shields uh, Grant and his army from most of the Confederate forces. Well, you cross by Pierre and get into the area south of the Big Black River, and Grant has a couple of choices. Well, the logical choice would be just to march north through to Vicksburg, right? You cross uh, the Big Black River here at Thompson's Ferry or uh, Hankinson's Ferry or Hall's Ferry and just march straight north through to Vicksburg. Grant doesn't do this. Why not? Well, he says, I don't want to get trapped in an area where I can't maneuver. Look at, at the kind of the triangle you got here with the Mississippi River, the Big Black River, and, and the railroad here. You put yourself in that area and things start going sideways, you're not going to be able to maneuver, you're not going to be able to, to, to move your troops right and, and, uh, and so on. So Grant doesn't want to enter that trap. So what he does, he starts marching to the northeast, moving toward the railroad east of the Big Black River, in order to cut that railroad because there is only one lifeline supply line to Vicksburg and that is the Southern Railroad of Mississippi. So let's move northward and let's cut that railroad, sit straddle that railroad and we got them. As long as Pemberton is dumb enough to stay in Vicksburg, east uh, west of the, of the Big Black River. And Grant's probably, he never says it, but he's probably thinking there's a pretty good chance Pemberton's that dumb. <laughs> and as it turns out, Pemberton is that dumb. Uh, there's a little bit more adaptability here. When Grant moves uh, northward after a slight delay on May the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, he doesn't start moving northward until about the 7th or 8th. Uh, he moves through Cayuga and Utica and anybody from western New York? Do you recognize those? Cayuga, Utica. Why don't we get all these New York names in Mississippi? Well, there are a bunch of New Yorkers uh, that have settled this area. They bring their, their names with them. Uh, most famously, of course, whose sister oh, is living on a plantation that Grant encounters here. George Meade's sister lives on a plantation in Mississippi, of all places. Anyway, Grant moves forward, uh, intending to catch the railroad. He gets a little bit uh, sidetracked here with this little battle at Raymond on May the 12th where a Confederate brigade shows up. Grant is intending to, to hook around this way uh, to meet Pemberton, of course, in, in Vicksburg. But, okay, over here on my right flank, there's something going on. Maybe concentrated out of Jackson. All right, we got we to gotta take care of this, see what's going on. So Grant will adapt and will shift his forces to take Jackson and to neutralize Jackson as a transportation area, as a staging area for Confederate forces to, to, um, to hit him. Uh, and once he takes Jackson, then he will begin to move back westward 
toward Vicksburg. Pemberton has cooperated. Most of Pemberton's army has remained uh, west of the Big Black River. Joseph E. Johnston, of course, arrives in Jackson uh, kind of the day before Grant gets there. And the famous you know, letter he writes, I'm already too late. And that's Joseph E. Johnson for you, you know, the gloomy, <laughs> gloomy Joe Johnson. Um, at any rate, Grant will fight the major battles at Raymond on the 12th, Jackson on the 14th, the decisive battle for Vicksburg on the 16th at Champion Hill, and then we'll secure the railroad crossing of uh, the Big Black River and other crossings as well at the Big Black River on May the 17th. So, going to the railroad, yeah, he does it. He has to adapt just a little bit, though, but he has Pemberton now pinned west of the, of, the, uh, of the Big Black River, and Pemberton will hightail it back into Vicksburg. So, Grant, in the next few days, will move and encircle Vicksburg there, which will lead to the next major decision. What are we on? Number six? I tell my students, all right, right now, one, two, three, four, five, six, um, so that they can keep up with it. But the main thing is, so when I get off track, I can ask them, what number are we on now? <laughs> six. We're on number six. So I think it's number six. Um, what do we do now? We got them hemmed into Vicksburg. What do we do? Yeah. Well, you might lose some troops there. Do you lay siege? Exactly, exactly. What do you do? Well, Grant decides to assault. He decides to, to launch assaults against the Confederate works, and there are several good reasons, I think, that Grant has, and they're pretty logical reasons. Uh, number one, he thinks the Confederates are demoralized. Who wouldn't be? You got whipped at Port Gibson, at Raymond, at Jackson, at, Port, at uh, Champion Hill, at Big Black River Bridge. Who wouldn't be demoralized? So Grant's thinking all we got to do is, again, just walk up and say, boo, and, and they'll say, we surrender, we surrender. Um, now, what Grant does take into account, yes, Three divisions of Pemberton's army is demor are demoralized, but there are two others that weren't involved in the debacle at Champion Hill and Big Black River Bridge that had been guarding Haynes Bluff and Snyder's Bluff and Warrington and all that uh, that weren't part of this this debacle, and they're the ones that take the 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 forefront of the defenses at Vicksburg, and so they're not quite as as demoralized. Uh, Grant has other reasons. He says his troops would not stand for a siege without knowing that they couldn't take it by assault. That's a little bit dubious, I think. Uh, what I've found, I'm working on a book on the May 19th and 22nd assaults, and what I've found is these guys are saying, you want us to go attack those works? That, that, really? I don't want to do that, but if you say to do it, okay, we will. Uh, they're not too interested in it. They'd probably rather see a siege than, than an assault. Um, he says that uh, we're worried about our rear, you know, uh, Joseph E. Johnston is, is uh, coming back into Jackson. Once we left, they come back into Jackson, and they're going to come provide relief for Vicksburg. So we need to go ahead and get this thing taken care of before more Confederates show up uh, behind us. We um, are going to, if we lay siege, and this turns into a months-long thing, they're going to have to send reinforcements down to, to reinforce us here. If we go ahead and take care of it now, then we won't have to worry about it. They, those reinforcements can be utilized somewhere else. Uh, he talks about the timing. He says, you know, if we dilly-dally around and this draws out on into July and August, uh, the summer's going to be spent and we won't be able to have a good campaigning weather for months thereafter and, and so on. So there, there are numerous, numerous reasons Grant says, let's go ahead and assault. And so he will assault with a part of Sherman's Corps, Blair's division, on the 19th. That's unsuccessful. And he says, all right, we're going to do it right on the 22nd. And the whole army is supposed to attack. And... Some of the army attacks, others don't. McClernand says, send me more troops. I made it into the forts, which he hadn't. And there's a whole lot about that and, and so on. But uh, none of the assaults work. And that, uh, that basically ends the idea. And Grant says, all right, enough of that. We're not going to assault anymore. But the decision to assault, let's try to get this done as quickly as we can. And in fact, Grant will actually write his father, one of these really interesting letters, um, later on and says, you know, this campaign, it's only a matter of time before we get Vicksburg. I, I realize that, but I had, I had desired so much more out of this. It, it, uh, he almost describes it as a failure at this point. He says, I, I wanted so much more out of this to go ahead and get it done, and then we can march eastward to Jackson and the Meridian and Tom Bigby River and all that, and none of that's going to be possible now. I, I wanted so much more out of this. Uh, so Grant probably is a little, a little too hard on himself. Okay, seventh decision. And we're getting toward the end here. We've only got one decision now. It's like being surrounded. You know, it kind of cuts down on your, your choices there. 
we got to lay siege. And so they start the, the saps and the, the traverse, not traverses, but the, um, uh, the, the movements and the parallels and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and we'll lay siege to Vicksburg, and we know about the 47 days of, of the siege. Somebody got the book, one there, one at 47 days of siege or, or something like that. Um, there's argument there whether the assaults are part of the siege and whether it's 47 days or actually 44 days or, or whatever, but, you know, that's, that's uh, semantics. At any rate, Grant will lay siege. Uh, his intention is to move the parallel so close to the Confederate works that he will launch another assault on July the 6th. He intends to, he gives orders for the assault on July the 6th. But in the meantime, of course, Pemberton will decide, uh, you know, the game's up and he will surrender on July the 4th and that will end the siege of Vicksburg. And again, of course, Mississippi River goes unvexed to the sea as soon as Port Hudson surrenders, of course, a little bit later on. Uh, that necessitates then the final decision that Grant has to make. What do I do with all these troops? All these, all these prisoners. Are we going to send them north to prison camps? Well, he learned a lesson at Fort Donaldson. He sent like 14,000 northward and completely overflowed the, the penal system in the north, the military penal system. And so we're going to send twice that now. It's going to take boats to get them up there. You've got to put them in prisons, feed them, and all that kind of stuff. Everybody tells Grant, just parole them, let them go. Don't fool with, with sending them to prison camps. Porter's telling him this because Porter's the one who's going to have to transport them. Grant and Division Commander Frederick Steele are the only ones that says, no, I want them to go to prison camps. But Grant basically talks to his officers and, and so on. And this is another one of those cases Grant says in his memoirs, well, I thought we ought to parole them and so on. His letters at the time are saying, no, I don't want them paroled. And against my better judgment, I went with the, the majority of the officers and he paroled the troops and, uh, and let, them, let them go. And there's evidence that a lot of them don't ever enter the war again. And basically he's hoping they'll all just go home and stay home and uh, we won't have to fool with them anymore. Although some they're capturing again at Missionary Ridge in November. They go right back into the, into the army after they are exchanged. So parole, what do we do with all of them? Uh, and Grant chooses to, to parole. Uh, so nutshell, eight major decisions in the Vicksburg campaign. Not all of them are conventional. Some of them are very risky. But I think the, the whole Vicksburg campaign itself, through Grant's eyes, uh, teaches us some things about Grant. It teaches us things about military history and how to do things. Um, it shows us, of course, uh, the adaptability. It shows us Grant's uh, just basically, his, well, what John Marzalek calls his bulldog mentality. Is, did, did John, John was up here last year, I think. Did he tell you the story about uh, how it was just fate that the Grant Presidential Library go to Mississippi State University? Um, basically, he looked through the official records and he found a letter, it's like from 1864, that Lincoln wrote to Grant. And he said that Lincoln told Grant to, to uh, grab on and chew and hold with a bulldog grip. Mississippi State Bulldogs. He said it's fate that Grant goes to, to, to Mississippi State because he's to hold on with a bulldog grip. Uh, and he's now a Mississippi State Bulldog. Anyway, um, never give up. Hold on, chew and tear and, and so on with a bulldog grip. You can see a bulldog Grant operating in the Vicksburg campaign. Adaptability, you can see Grant just, all right, that's fine, that didn't work. No skin off my back, we'll do something different. Can't do it that way, we'll do it a, a, a different way. Uh, so we learn a lot about Grant, uh, and again, I uh, emphasize, throw into the midst of all of these military decisions, dealing with owning land and buying new land up in Galena at the time, Losing his teeth, dealing with his father, dealing with politicians, uh, all of these, all of these different issues going on, and I think it illustrates uh, just what a job Grant had. But I think it also illustrates just what a job well done it was for Grant, uh, as he's juggling all these balls in the Vicksburg campaign, and lo and behold, he comes out victorious. And I think there's a reason that we, some of us, look at Grant as probably the best general produced during the Civil War. And I think Vicksburg is a lot of evidence toward that, uh, toward that idea. Thank you very much. <laughs> Do we have time for questions? Or, uh, have I used all my time? Or Okay, we got a question back there, and then we'll get right here. Yeah, uh, a supply question. I attended a lecture earlier this week at Pittsburgh, where Sherman's March was discussed. And they were talking about 
uh, stated that by the time the Army reached Savannah, that people were near starvation, that, you know, it's somewhat of a myth that they went off of the uh, The same story, I think, is what we hear about Grant's march here after he crossed the river. How well supplied were they, if at all, after the Army crossed that's a very good question. I purposely didn't go into that because it's a, it's a whole story, but i give you the, the nutshell. Uh, Grant learns a lot in the Mississippi Central campaign earlier. And in fact, he says later on, had I known then what I, or had I known then what I know now, I would have continued on and known I could have lived off the land. You know, um, The problem with this, though, is that um, when, you, when you cross the river south of Vicksburg here and start marching inland, uh, he says we can do a lot in eight days. It's going to take him 18 days, of course, to, to reach the point where you take Haynes Bluff and you open up you know, a new, new supply line here from, uh, in the Yazoo River. Uh, by the end of those 18 days, his guys are going two or three days without anything to eat. So supplies are scarce. Um, when Grant crosses, he issues like three days rations. He tells them, make them last five you know, the, he realizes this this is going to be some issue. The idea that he completely cuts off his supply line, though, is is a myth. Uh, there is a supply line, maybe not a traditional supply line in the sense of uh, Germany and, and Napoleon and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but what we're looking at is when Grant's moving northward, he is living off the land. I mean, you there, that's plain. Uh, in fact, there's a humorous story that uh, when they finally reach Vicksburg and get a new line of supply and all that kind of stuff. Uh, they start getting mail from the north, and all the friends and, and wives and, and parents and all that are sending them uh, all kind of goods and so on, and they're sending them like chickens and stuff. And Grant says uh, the soldiers just really aren't in the mood for that because all they've been eating for the last 17 days are ducks and chickens and all that that they're getting off these plantations, and so they're they're sick of fowl. They want some, some meat meat, you know. Um, but they are gathering a lot of that as you go through. Now, here's the kicker, though. You can, you can gather oats and, and stuff for the horses on plantations. You can get some chickens and, and all that on the plantations. Uh, you, can, you can get some other supplies, food supplies and all that on plantations. But what can you, what that an army has to have, can you not harvest from a plantation owner's fields in the midst of a military campaign? Mini balls. You cannot harvest, uh, no farmer, no plantation owner, grows mini balls, ammunition, in his field. You have to get that ammunition. He fights. How many battles? Five battles? You have to replenish your ammunition. So where is that coming from? Well, what Grant does is he, once they take Grand Gulf, outflank Grand Gulf, he will start supplies moving northward by wagon train that is guarded by at least a brigade, maybe at times division strength units, and throughout the campaign, up until about May the 14th, he's got wagon trains leaving Grand Gulf coming to catch up with the Army. Now, the last one leaves, I think, on the 14th. Um, there's a big one uh, guarded by Blair, Frank Blair's division, that just barely gets to the Army in time to participate in Champion Hill. Uh, along with that division is also the only pontoon train with the Army which is not your regular wood boats that you, you normally see back east. It's actually rubber rafts. They build a, a pontoon train out of a, a bridge out of rubber rafts. And Sherman lays that at Bridgeport up here um, north of uh, Big Black River Bridge. Um, the last supply train to reach the Army, I believe, is guarded by uh, Ransom's Brigade of McPherson's Corps. You know T.G. Ransom from, from Chicago and so on. Uh, that's the last unit to reach the Army, uh, and that's like the 17th, so 18th, 19th, until they open up this supply line here north of Vicksburg. Things are getting pretty scarce, and you're reading these letters and diaries and so on, they talk about, we ain't had anything to eat for two or three days. And Grant talks about in his memoirs, riding by, and some soldier says, heart attack. And then other soldiers say, heart attack. And they start, you know, kind of trolling Grant a little bit, you know, give us some heart attack. We want some bread. And, uh, and eventually the, the line of supply will open. So it's a myth that he absolutely cuts off all supplies. Um, but it's kind of a hybrid supply line, if you will, not your standard supplied by railroads with cars reaching, you know, your, your army every day. Okay, we had a, a question here. Yeah, on the decision to attack Vicksburg, didn't he 
ask his three commanders about that attack, and only McLaren agreed with Grant on attacking? <laughs> sort of. I haven't found evidence that he calls. The, in fact, Grant says, I never held a council of war in my life. Uh, the decision was always my own. That's where I get the, the title there. Um, he doesn't he doesn't necessarily ask, but you got some pretty loud mouth <laughs> corps commanders here that aren't afraid to speak their mind. Sherman already told Grant, You're this is a dumb idea. Uh, and basically that famous story about he write he tells Grant, Don't do this, and Grant won't listen. And then he writes this letter and Grant takes the letter and Reads the letter and says, okay, all right, and puts it in his pocket, and you never read about it until 20 years later. But Sherman basically, in the almost actual wordage is, uh, Sherman tells Grant that any Confederate commander would maneuver gladly a year to catch your army where you are willingly placing it with one foot in the Mississippi River. Don't do this. Go back to Memphis and do it the right way. Uh, on the other hand, the other loud mouth, McClernand, is telling him, yeah, boy, let's go. Let's let's go get them. Why? Because I want all the glory. I'll, I'll win the battle and, and, and get all the glory. Now, then you've got the third corps commander, McPherson, who's really a non-entity in this, and I think Ed Bars sums it up best when he says, if Grant turned the corner, Ed, uh, McPherson would break his nose. <laughs> so he's going to do whatever Grant basically says. You never heard Ed say that? <laughs> if Grant turned a corner, McPherson would break his nose. So anyway, um, yeah, yes, you're, that's somewhat right that, that McClernand is the one saying, yes, let's go ahead and do this, and the others are saying, I don't know. And, and there's a little bit of evidence that you see that Sherman and McPherson don't push their assaults quite to the extent yeah. that McClernand does. Um, so, all right, we had a question uh, right here, and then we'll get yours. I was wondering... How much of a threat were the Confederates that were under Johnston? And would, would they have done better with somebody other than Johnston? Well, I, I was just sitting here thinking, you know, the old saying is, uh, I would rather, I think, well, who knows, said it, Napoleon or Alexander the Great, probably Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> the old saying is, I'd rather have an army of rabbits commanded by a lion than an army of lions commanded by a rabbit. Um, I don't think they're a threat at all as long as they're commanded by Joseph E. Johnson. I mean, Johnson's probably sitting here thinking, how are we going to defend the Florida Keys at this point? You know, uh, I did. Under Johnson, I don't think they're a threat at all. Under a different commander, perhaps, perhaps so. Yes, sir? Um, I could never understand in the old Vicksburg campaign why Johnston didn't do more. I mean, Grant was blowing west of Jackson. Uh, he had Johnson at his back. Why didn't Johnson do anything? Right. Well, that it goes to Johnson's personality more than anything. He arrives in Mississippi on the 14th or the 13th with the mindset that we're already defeated. He writes that letter, I am already too late. Uh, and so his mindset is, I'm not going to be able to do anything. And so let's just get out of here. Uh, but when, when Grant turns, and you see this here, when he turns and, and moves eastward, uh, he leaves McClernand at Baker's Creek on Champion Hill Battlefield, basically, before it was the Champion Hill Battlefield, uh, to watch the rear while everybody's moving eastward toward Jackson. Well, there's not a lot of defense of Jackson, uh, not a, a big battle and, and all that, and so Grant will basically destroy Jackson as a, as a military center and even more. You know what the nickname of Jackson was after, after the war? They called it Chimneyville. It was all that was left, a bunch of chimneys. Uh, so then when... Grant turns and moves westward. Yes, he does have to, to worry about his rear, but a couple of things. He has, he has spooked Johnson so much that Johnson has moved northward to Canton and, and is in retreat mode rather than, than offensive mode, and I've never seen Johnson in any other mode than retreat mode much. <laughs> but um, the other thing is for Johnson, and we're talking miles here, to, to start a campaign to go and attack Grant's rear, particularly when he gets east of or west of the Big Black River near Vicksburg, uh, you've got to have a lot of logistical support and you've got to be able to facilitate that uh, hopefully by rail and Jackson has been neutralized as a rail center so if Johnson is going to launch that type of campaign into Grant's rear uh, he will have to carry all of his provisions by wagon and that is a little bit of a larger you know, nut to crack and, and so on. So uh, there, there are different issues that are, that are involved here. Yes, sir. You mentioned uh, what cost McClernand his position. Of course, he's sent home to Springfield for the rest of the war. 
because of that message he sent for requesting reinforcement. Right. The number of Illinois troops were slaughtered as a result of that. But would they have, would Grant and, and uh, Sherman have treated them that way if he was a West Pointer? Instead of a general? Well, that is that is McClernand's argument that I'm not a West Pointer. I'm a politician, and as a result, I, I you know, if I captured Richmond myself, it wouldn't be good enough. And and I think there is some some truth in that. Uh, however, sending this order, this unpublished order, you know, to the newspapers and and so on, without getting permission from the War Department grant and, and all that, um, I think it's Charles Dana that uh, says it best, and he says that is the occasion of the removal, not the cause. Uh, and Grant has been think he is he's come that close several times during the campaign uh, to removing McClernand. In fact, he gets the political cover he needs on May the 14th when Grant finally takes Jackson and spends the night there in the Bowman Hotel, uh, his headquarters in the State House there in in Jackson. Uh, he's getting mail with these these supplies that are coming. You know, he's he's getting mail from Grand Gulf. One of those contains a letter from Henry Halleck that says, remove McClernand if you need to. We, we've heard enough, remove McClernand if you want to. So again, Grant has this, what does he do? <laughs> Sticks it in his pocket, okay, I'll use this later when I need it. And he comes close to using it a couple of times, particularly after the debacle of the May 22nd assault, which they completely blame on McClernand, which I'm not so sure is all McClernand's fault. But uh, eventually on, uh, I think it's the 19th or so of June, Grant says, I've, I've had enough. Now, I have a sneaking suspicion that there's a little more to it. Uh, you know, if you, if you look at who has the most dangerous jobs in the whole Vicksburg campaign, who leads the way southward in Louisiana? It's McClernand. Who leads the way northward in Mississippi? It's McClernand. Who has the critical left flank by the, the uh, uh, Big Black River? It's toward Vicksburg. It's McClernand. Who is the backdoor shield while the army is moving toward Jackson? It's McClernand. Grant, Grant's leaning on McClernand. He's dependent on McClernand. Uh, and I think by the 19th of June, Grant's saying, okay, we got this thing wrapped up. It's just absolutely a matter of time. And I don't need this guy anymore, so let's dump him. Let's get rid of him. You know, So he used him while he needed him, but then uh, kind of throws him under the bus. And I think there's some evidence that Grant throws other people under the bus as well, uh, including Lou Wallace and uh, uh, Rosecrans, and there's some scholarship that's come out uh, on that as well. All right, have we got more time, or are we, we done? Okay, all right. Got to go. Larry? Yeah. Could you tell us, in your opinion, the best chance the Confederates had of defeating Grant? Oh, uh, hmm. If they had one, could they? Probably, well, define defeat. Uh, is that destroying Grant's army on the battlefield or turning back? No, holding Vicksburg. Holding Vicksburg, okay. Probably the best chance they would have had uh, of, of stalling the disaster that's in the making is to hold the high ground where Grant crosses at Bruinsburg um, and and not giving them the chance, you know, Chickasaw Bio played out again. Don't, don't let them reach the high ground. If you fortify and hold that high ground wherever they come across. Now the problem is Grant's got the opportunity to come across in a million different spots and you got, I, I just heard on the news the other day talking about this war on terrorism and all that and, uh, and basically the guy, I don't remember who it was or whatever, but he was saying, you know, the terrorists only have to be right once, but we got to be right every single time. Mm -hmm. And that makes it very, very difficult. And he was saying, we're going to have another terrorist attack, basically, is what he was saying. Uh, but the Confederates have to be right every time. Um, and they were wrong when Grant crosses the, the, the river there, mainly because Pemberton's head is just spinning here, basically. And I'll give a plug for Grierson's raid. Because of Grierson's raid that is coming way off over, over here, um, Pemberton is now looking north and east rather than west and south where the major threat is. And there are a lot of other, you know, stuff going on. Sherman is, is uh, feigning up here in, uh, in late April. Um, you've got other, other diversions and so on. I kind of, 
uh, liken it to a football super play where you have a player in motion and you you snap the ball and you you fake a uh, draw and you pull your guard and you you fake a quarterback sneak and you you run a reverse and then you run a flea flicker and then you give it back to the quarterback and he pump fakes a, a hail mary and tucks the ball and runs right up the middle. I mean a super duper jazzy play. You got people going all over the place and Grant standing there with the ball and just runs it runs it right up the gut. And so Pemberton's watching all this, and his head is absolutely spinning. We're, we're, they're over here. Now they're over here. Now they're over here. Where in the world are they? And when Grant runs the ball right up the gut, crosses Bruinsburg, there's not a Confederate to be seen. And that probably was the best chance that they would have had, because if you stop them at the river, again, there's no plan B. Where do you go? You just keep going on down the river. Well, let's go capture New Orleans again, kind of thing. You know, uh, What good is that going to do? Um, just off the top of my head, I'm, that's probably what I would, would would think. Yes, sir, you, and then we'll get you. Uh, the terrain between Vicksburg and Grand Gulf, was there a no good crossing point for Grand there? Uh, no. At, uh, uh, you mean crossing the Mississippi River? Yeah. No, there's no good, good crossing point there. Um, their Confederate guns as far down as Warrington, and I didn't put Warrington on the on the map here. Uh, but then you get into a lot of the bios. If we, can we go back one one map, look at uh, see all these bios and, and water routes and and all that kind of stuff. Uh, plus, you cross here, and all of a sudden, you know, you could have crossed at Davis Bend and captured Jefferson Davis's plantation house, Briarfield. But uh, you cross here, and that puts you into this this triangle of of uh, problems here. Too. And so Grant is thinking purposefully about landing below the Big Black River. Doesn't intend to blow to land below Bio Pierre necessarily, but he's thinking certainly land below the Big Black River to give us kind of a shield here uh, before we move forward. So that's that's kind of the reason that he does that. Yes, sir. I was just uh, curious about we're talking about Joe Johnson, right? He was uh, given command to try to leave Vicksburg. Well, what would you say about the dysfunction? Richmond. Oh, absolutely. Everything in there, and how they look at this part of the of that time in the war, right. and how Richmond's focus wasn't yeah. what was going on in Mississippi, and then part of it was considered a northern or urban. Oh, that place. Also yeah. Where, where was uh, Bedford? The Bedford Forest. Uh, General Forrest during all this. Work. Uh, he's up in Tennessee. He's he's uh, chasing Abel Strait's mule march uh, across I mean, Northern Alabama. Kind of coordination to try to bring him down? And no, no. And remember, I mean, forest is not the forest that we think of now. Rice's Crossroads and all that. At that point, you know, he's he's uh, he's not reached that level. But yeah, you know, I get on Pemberton a little bit. I, I you know, it's fun to George pick Johnson on a little bit. No, he doesn't. He's he's not an ally of, of Jefferson Davis. Uh, and, you know, put yourself in Pemberton's shoes. You're getting orders from your department commander, Joseph E. Johnston. Get out of Vicksburg. Get out. It, it's You can't hold it. It's a trap. Get out of Vicksburg. Get east of the, of the Big Black River. Get out of there. Jefferson Davis, on the other hand, is telling him at the exact same time, and, of course, Davis outranks Johnston, and he's saying, hold Vicksburg. Vicksburg is the nail that holds the two South abs together. Whole Vicksburg. So you're Pemberton. What do you do? I mean, you're gonna make somebody mad. It's like an argument between your wife and your mother-in-law. You know, you're gonna make somebody <laughs> mad. No offense, mothers-in-law, but uh, <laughs> you're gonna make somebody mad. And who do you who do you choose to make mad? You know, and Pemberton's kind of in a in a no-win situation here. Well, I promise. No, I, you, we are getting to you. So. Pemberton have any cavalry at all? So, are they providing any intelligence? He does have some cavalry, uh, most notably Wirt Adams, Mississippi Cavalry Regiment, that is supposed to be guarding. Uh, get my handy dandy thing here. Uh, the the crossings as far down as Bio Pierre and even below. That's uh, under John Bowen, Wirt Adams, Mississippi Cavalry. But at this point in late April, anybody know where Wirt Adams Cavalry is? Chasing, chasing Benjamin Grierson down into Louisiana. So there is no cavalry covering uh, this area, and most all other mounted troops have been sent after Grierson as well. 
All right. Thank you very much.